As heavy weather rolls into the Pacific Northwest, the action kicks off for the Coast Guard. Attaboy, Danny! High seas force a mariner to choose between his home and his safety. This is my home, so I can't leave her. And Cape Disappointment's boat crew sets out for a man stranded at sea for days. I don't know, man. This guy is, uh... He's honestly delirious from the dehydration. A little beside himself. This guy's kind of out of control. High peaks and tumultuous waters make Cape Disappointment and the Pacific Northwest one of the most hazardous environments in North America. At the heart of it all is the Columbia River Bar. This deadly area has taken countless vessels and claimed hundreds of lives. In the air and on the sea, brave men and women of the U.S. Coast Guard risk their own safety so that others may live. In a place known as the Graveyard of the Pacific. DIW at 5 o'clock tonight, he'd be around by 11 tonight. Correct. Lieutenant Commander Dan Leary, Aircraft Commander, Sector Columbia Road. We got a heads up at about 11.30 in the morning that this 40-foot sailing vessel with one occupant on board was about 15 miles off Cape Lookout in the southern end of our AOR. It was taken on water intermittently, had some problems with his bilges, and at the time, the seas were 30, 35 feet, and the winds were up to 60, 65 knots. So if we're assuming total That's propulsion it. loss, mm -hmm. where he drift is the red or the magenta? That's the higher probability. Scale. We discussed this, but we knew that if we did need to hoist him due to the seas and the winds, we wanted to do it during the day, not at night. We really advised him that he needed to come off his vessel due to the weather, uh, his intermittent bilges, and some problems he was having in his engine room. Uh, and he said, no, I'm not coming off. We need to tell him, we can get you off during the day. We're not guaranteeing we can get you get you off this vessel at night. And you're putting your life in your own hands. If all of a sudden you get a mayday, 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 I'm sinking. They're going to call you down. Yeah. Yes. If you get that call, just go. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. OK. I'll check back in a half hour. Got you posted. Go, go let Sean know what's going on. We're about to talk to the boat right now. So, oh, OK. But if you're going to talk to the boat, then I'll stick around. Vessel the Rock, this is Coast Guard Sector, Columbia River. This is Sailing Vessel the Rock. How are you making way at this time? Very, very poorly. It's pretty tough out here. Is he going to stay there or is he going to make way somewhere? What are your plans at this time? Well, I guess the bars are all closed, so I need to try to get out so I can heave too. This is too close to the lay shore. I'm AMT2 John Neff, flight mechanic, air station Astoria. The bars were closing. The bars are where the coastal rivers flow out to the open Pacific. During the big storms, the force of the river coming out plus the waves coming in will create just almost a washing machine effect at the entrance to the bars. That's why they close the bars to um, smaller vessels or many times all vessels uh, because it'd be almost suicidal. You probably would get flipped or hit the jetty or be smashed on the rocks. To pull you off the vessel at this time during daylight would be much easier and safer. Roger, I understand that. This is my home, so I can't leave her until it's time to leave. It appears you're in diminishing conditions. It might be that time. These uh, winter storms in the Pacific Northwest are really common, actually. And uh, it's funny, because the rest of the country would call this a hurricane. We just call it an everyday storm. So. They usually roll in two or three days, about 80 mile an hour winds sometimes, and uh, just roll big seas. Everyone knows to usually to keep their heads down, and we don't get a lot of calls, but uh, every now and then you get someone like this who got caught in it. We ask you to very carefully uh, assess your situation and determine if it, if and when the time to leave may be now. Over. Roger, uh, it's not now, but uh, if anything develops in the future, I'll let you know. Thank you very much. Roger, sector out. All right, a little sit tight. And, uh, just, uh, eat. I would recommend if you're going to eat, eat now. So about 6 p.m., we tell them, hey, there's no guarantee we can come get you after dark, OK? The weather is such and so bad that we may not get there. And I think that hit him and finally said, OK, come get me. And we kind of did a double take, like, what? Did you just say, come get me? 
Uh, it's still a little bit of daylight, we should get there on scene with some sun up. You know, there's a lot of rain bands been passing through. The waves are huge, and um, you can really tell the 40-foot boat like this is going to get tossed around. And there's another band of storm coming through. The winds are going to really pick up and make this a lot harder. All right, guys, so we'll do a quick hazard analysis. There's probably not going to be any obstacles out there. We'll keep an eye out, reevaluate if we see any, but risk versus gain. This guy can die if we don't get him. Yeah. 12 o'clock, right below us. Doors going open. So, so. There's that huge mast, which in 20 to 25 foot seas just wants to hit us. And then off of that mast is guy wires. So it's almost impossible to uh, to hoist to, the, to a sailboat. Just so uh, we're all clear, my game plan is not to hoist to this boat at all. Works for me. Roger that. I'll just ask to abandon ship. You see him all right now, Chief? Yes, sir, I've got him good, thank you. Boats are washed in 20 to 25 foot seas. The sails are down. They're all over the place. And for lack of better words, the boat looked like a yard sail. There was stuff all over the front lawn. My suggestion would be ask him to go off the stern and then put me in. Just off. let me swim to him, and we'll do a vast recovery followed by mirror hook. OK. Or we'll tell him to abandon ship. Yeah, sailing vessel the rock. Right now, our swimmer's getting ready. So if you can be prepared to leave, um, that way, we, as soon as you're in the water, we're ready to pick you up, over. Roger that. Sounds good. Sounds remarkably good spirits for losing his boat. Yeah, he has stayed remarkably calm. Joel Sayers, I'm the Aviation Survival Technician Chief here at Air Station Story. You always want to make sure that you're prepared for whatever might happen. What we do not want is for the boat to be caught in the seas, him to abandon the ship, and then be caught next to the vessel itself. Say the best of the rock. You can get in the water off your stern at this time. Roger that. I'll be going to windward. The boat is rolling around. Something fierce. Yeah, because you only want to get off. It looks like he's getting off the back left side. There he goes. He's in the water. All right, when you're ready, you can go ahead and begin the hoist. Roger. Someone's going out the door. Summer's on his way down. Mr. Summer's holding. Easy back and left, hold position. Forward right, 10. Summer's away, Summer's okay. Summer's approaching survivor. I got in the water and I swam up to him and I looked at him and the first thing I said to him was, I'm really, really sorry about your boat. I'm sorry for the loss of your home. And he kind of looked at me and he said, that's okay. He kind of made the joke that it was stuff. I think he realized that he had made the best decision with what he had in front of him. And with that decision, at that point, he was just leaving it to us to help. Basket is halfway to water. Basket's in the water. All positions back. They laid out kind of a catenary, which is basically the basket's in the water, and the cable has a loop in it, which allows for a shock absorber between the equipment in the water and the helicopter, so it moves with the seas. Easy left. Position. The seas seem to come from a lot of different directions. It's very challenging to know just how much cable you have out and not jerk the basket. And out a little slack. Oh, accidentally jerked him. OK. And out slack. Take it right. Take the slack. Take the load. Take the load. And he took a pretty good jerk. But he was in the basket. I was able to con the helicopter forward, and I hoisted him aboard. Fiber is out of the basket. She's ready to pick up. Roger. Disconnecting hoist hook, ready for one bear hook recovery of the storm. When you're ready, you can get on. Roger, hook's going out the door. Hook is on its way down. Door is at 3 o'clock little. Took a pretty good wave. Ball position. And somewhere lost the hoist hook. It was a little tricky considering the uh, wave state. I would get the rescue hook to him, he would have it and then the wave would take him to the left and forward, and then i see the hook had been taken away. Lock the hoist hook again. Just put it in the water and tell me where you need me to go. She's ready to pick up. Roger. Disconnecting hoist hook, ready for one bear hook recovery of the storm. We got a call from a sailing vessel in distress. 
the seas have been terrible out there all day and we thought everyone was at least in harbor. This guy obviously got caught outside the bars. He didn't know where to go, what to do, and his boat's getting beat up pretty bad. We put the basket down to recover the survivor first and uh, that goes real well. The next evolution was to get Chief and he wanted a bear hook. He didn't want the basket again because this is another metal object to get slammed into down there. So we tried to get the bear hook down to him. All right, that's three o'clock little. Took a pretty good wave. All positions. And Summer lost the hoist hook. All positions. Summer's at 3 o'clock low. He's hooking up. Easy port and right. Lost the hoist hook again. You want to abort? Yeah, we're going to. The hook came to me the first time. Uh, as I went to hook up, it actually flew out of my hands. They tried a second time. Again, it was pulled out of my hands. For the flight mechanic in the back, he's looking down into the seas. And he can see the movement, but he can't see the height. And he can't see that three waves back, there's one that's bigger than the other couple. The seas right now, they're varying anywhere between 19 and 22 feet. So they chose to use a basket. Well, take it to a can, Harry. Put it in the water and tell me where you need me to go. Roger. That's the outside cabin door. Basket's on its way down. Basket's in the water. Forward. We're in the basket. We're in the basket. We're ready for pickup. He really got slammed by a wave, and he managed to hang on, got back in the basket. Swing, control swing. But now I have an oscillating basket with Joel in it, and really had to struggle to get the swing under control. Basket's oscillating. Basket's below cabin door. Basket. Basket's inside cabin. Hoist complete. Air 6029, we have the uh, sailboat captain on board. We're headed back to uh, air station. Imagine putting yourself in a dryer and turning it on the high spin cycle. He'd been bouncing around in this boat for over 18 hours with no sleep. And now he can finally just relax. That's got to be very comforting. We know what she's been about. It'll be just minute. He's getting this gentleman set up with a uh, passenger vest right now. Coming back to the station was interesting because you've got a gentleman who's now lost his home and everything he owns to the point that he had no money. However, he was very happy. So that kind of brought joy to the crew that we felt like, you know, we did a good thing that night. He said being a firefighter before, that the idea that I, now I was coming as a rescuer to help him, a rescuer helping a rescuer, that we had formed a bond, and I would agree. I hope to keep up with him just to make sure that he's okay. Tonight, we're gonna try to help him out with finding a place to stay. Tomorrow, we'll figure out the big stuff. Well, all right. So, Chief, hey, sorry we couldn't get you with the bear hook. We just couldn't get it done. Uh, sorry, it happens sometimes. But, uh, John, your recoveries are excellent. Yeah, John, you were calling calm the whole time. This is awesome. Well, I'm glad I at least sounded calm, sir. Uh -huh. My name's Dwayne Jones. I'm a retired firefighter. I worked as a firefighter for 24 years. I've been sailing for the last 10 years and preparing for sailing my vessel, the rock, around the world. I was leaving Grays Harbor to go to Newport, and the forecast was for three good days of weather. On Saturday evening, the weather was supposed to change to 40 knots and gusting to 50 but I wasn't able to get in uh, before the 40 knots kicked in. Try as I might, I couldn't get my vessel across into the bar. I fell short about five miles each time. Waited too late to get down the coast. Now we're dealing with this. Yeehaw. There's long stretches along Oregon that don't have any, any place to come in. And so that what, what happened is the wind picked up, the seas picked up, and closed all the bars before I could ever get there. My life was gonna be in immediate danger. That's why I left. When I got into the helicopter, it felt like safety and security, and hey, I'm glad, you know? I'm really glad. The vessel, the rock, is my home. It's my everything, everything I own, everything that I have, and it's gone. You know, as a firefighter, I've seen a lot of people lose a lot of things, and I know that it's just material things, and they are replaceable, but your life's not. 
The Coast Guard, the guys that came out to help, are awesome guys. And I really want to say thank you. They did a really nice job in difficult conditions. I just want to thank everybody. I do. <laughs> On your leg, reverse! I coach in Seaside, and Dave McCown, who I fly with quite a lot, coaches in Warrington. So there's that friendly rivalry going between the two of us. Come on, defense, discipline, focus! Calling the United States Coast Guard. There is a vessel in distress here. The person on the sailboat hasn't anything to eat or drink in the last two days, so he's been out there for a while. That's probably a shock too, huh? He could be, yeah, very well could be. Knowing the snap count, all right? Keeping our head in the game, let's do it. Lieutenant Commander Dan Leary, I'm a pilot at uh, Air Station Astoria, and I'm also an assistant football coach with the Seaside Gulls. Here we go, let's go! I coach in Seaside, and Dave McCown, who I fly with quite a lot, coaches in Warrington. So there's that camaraderie that we get from, you know, serving together, and then there's also that friendly rivalry going between the two of us, and uh, we're gonna see whose team uh, does better as we uh, bang heads with Warrington. On your leg, reverse! Boom, boom, there we go. That's all right, that's good field position, baby. That's good field position. Danny Leary on the Danny. Small town football is huge. The school's excited about it. The coaches and the players are all excited about it. Come on, defense, discipline, focus! Most folks in the Coast Guard volunteer in the community because we're here for three or four years. So the quicker you volunteer in a community, the quicker you meet the people you, you live with. There we go! Oh, yeah! Ah. We're playing so well. We're just giving up two big plays. It's all right. That's how you feel, baby. That's how you feel. Keep it up. We live in a small area. The towns are small. They take a lot of pride in their high school sports. It means a lot to the families. It means a lot to the area. Here we go! Oh, yeah! Oh, oh, oh. Just getting out here, being with the community, being outside of work, I just think it makes the camaraderie at work tighter. I think we have a better understanding when we fly together. We kind of understand what each other has been through. job, you're a gamer, I love it. Huge win for us, we've been waiting since the end of last season to, uh, to strap it back on and tonight they really came out and, uh, and showed that they want to play and, and they want to win. No matter the outcome, I take these boys that are here in high school and I try to give them what they need to become the best men that they can as they grow up. United States Coast Guard, Cape Disappointment. This is the fishing vessel, Don Rain. There is a vessel in distress here. He wants me to tow him. Clear. All right. All right, clear. All right, coming up. Beam one, Todd Gormley, Station Cape Disappointment. Got a phone call from a fishing boat that uh, there was a sailboat in distress. There's just one person on the uh, sailboat. He said he had lost all electronics. He was drifting into, into shore. The person on the sailboat hasn't anything to eat or drink in the last two days, so he's been out there for a while. That's probably a shock too, huh? He could be, yeah, very well could be. This guy was uh, in pretty rough shape. We need to get out there quick. Boats right up our bow, so I'm thinking that's probably them. Yeah. Kate, 47232, we are currently on scene with the Dawn Rain and the disabled sail vessel. Guys, watch your ears. Initially, when we got on scene, the fishing boat had the sailboat in tow. The individual on the sailboat was nowhere to be found. His boat was uh, in pretty rough shape. Some windows had been broken out. The boat was covered in, in paint. 
Sir, this is the Coast Guard. Can you hear me? Oh, there he is. What's that? Yeah, Sir, are you able to uh, disconnect your tow line? Can you go ahead and do that, please? He obviously didn't have any life jackets because he was wearing a, a fender he had tied to himself. Washington, tell him to put this on. As we never use these at Bristol Bay. We use those suits that you fall in, you go down. We got you. Just hearing that he was out there for a couple days was an alarm enough. And then to see how he was acting, it really kind of raised some flags that maybe this guy really needs to uh, get back to shore. We, I was about to take my baby on the ocean for his first boat cruise. All of a sudden, I'm like, this weather's gnarly. We're in the wrong spot. We're going to go back to work, if you don't mind. Roger, Captain. That's fine. OK. Don right out. Let's go ahead and uh, pass this gentleman those Nutri-Grain bars. Yeah, I got them. Actually, cut my bags off to make a lower. Got one with my freaking hair. It's a character. Yeah. This guy's kind of out of control. He told us that he was uh, catching salmon uh, by his hair. That was a first for me in my career, ever hearing that. Um, it was debatable. Hey, sir, we're going to pass you a radio so you can talk to us on the right end, OK? Stay on 22, 2, 2. We received a call about a sailing vessel a few miles south of the bar. And uh, he reportedly had been out there for a couple days and uh, needed assistance. Slack all that line out. Go 200. 200 high. That's speed. Jordan speed down. good. Line bang out. All right. Our gang, Motor Lifeboat, uh, how are things going over there, Captain? Rocking and rolling. Rocking and rolling. I don't know, man. This guy is, uh... He's honestly delirious from the dehydration. A little beside himself. We're on a master planner, an artist of every kind. We're actually going to take you guys to hand-blown lab for your boat. He likes to talk a lot. His boat's looking a little beat up. He was acting a little bit delirious. Maybe it's some dehydration. But for right now, we've got him in stern tow. And uh, we're going to make our way slow over to the bar. The initial plan was to tow him back across the bar in the 47. Once we got to the bar, we were going to have a boarding team come out, take the sailboat into side tow, and then take them into Ilwaco. All right, guys, with this guy, just don't let your guard down. Um, don't turn your back on him. Just watch out for each other. He's happy right now, but who knows? Nicholas Palisano and Bosa made first class. We had made a plan to, to take the vessel into, into the local harbor and then transfer tow there and tow him the rest of the way up the channel safely to the docks here. It's a little bit easier with the smaller boat. Taking off, we're going to go meet up with the 47-foot motor lifeboat. I'm going to stop real quick, evaluate. It's looking like it might be a little bit too choppy to take him inside tow. We might have to wait till we get closer to the harbor to do it. All right, we're coming back up. All right. Look at that. Getting paid to do this, guys. Woo! Oh, yeah. Okay, we're entering the bar right now. Over. How much fun do you think these guys have right now? It's probably having a laugh. You know, towing across the bar, you just want to always be uh, cognizant of what, where you're at, what conditions you're working in, because uh, anything can change. It's just going to be key that we manage the tow line by uh, applying the right amount of power at the right time. If all goes well, we'll have a smooth tow. Yeah, I see that 25. 5632. You want to take the tow before the gate's over. Yeah, roger that. We're planning to transfer the tow to the 25-foot response boat. We're going to do this at an area we call the Gates, which is a calmer water area. It's the boundary between the Pacific Ocean and the Owaco Channel. If you drag them in, we'll take them off your hand. I'll read the whole out. 5632, that sounds great. We got on scene on the bar. Like I said, we were waiting until we were getting into flat water. The transfer tow there. 5632, are you able to break off for surf first row? Roger that. Two, three, two, five, five, six. As we were discussing transferring tow, a second call came in of a surfer in distress. Let me let me think here. All right, guys, if we take this thing over here, I mean, it's less than five feet right now, but um, yeah, there's no way we can get to a surfer in the brakes. We need the 47. They're already in tow with them. I mean, if they were to break tow, we could hop over on this guy and they could head out. We had to kind of do triage at that point and uh, pick which which case was better for which asset. 232, 556. Five, Would you be able to break tow right here and uh, respond to that, and then we'll pick up your tow here? What do you think about that? 
sounds like a plan. So we made the decision that we would send the, the 47 foot motor lifeboat instead and we would take the uh, we would take tow right there on the bar. Hey guys, we're gonna break tow, then we gotta go find a surfer that's in distress. Ready? Right hey, break the bit! Ha! Bitch bro! Getting up port side! We were able to drop the tow where we had it, right in front of the gates. The 25 was able to pick it up. How you doing, buddy? We got a surfer, they gotta go help, so we're gonna take in tow. Ready on deck! You don't have to do anything, Captain. We'll hook you. We're just going to tow the sailboat in and hope everything works out with the other boat and with the surfers. Swimmer in distress. He's probably uh, running out of energy. Uh, conditions over uh, in this area are not ideal. So we need everyone up there looking for anyone in the water. The adjustment in mind state from a common tow to a possible person in the water is a total 180. You go from towing a boat in to saving lives. Josh, have you ever heard of people surfing over here? Absolutely. Right here is really good, actually. Running on the south side of the south jetty here so far. Uh, nobody in sight. Uh, we're just going to keep running up and down the jetty. Uh, When there's a person in the water, you immediately start thinking about friends or family that do the same types of activities, like surfing, swimming. So it, it sometimes hits personally. Gonna run out of viz here real quick. See the helo? With the sun going down, is, is kind of scary. Not only scary for him, but it could be scary for us. Keep your eyes peeled for crap on. That can ruin our night. It could be more beneficial to just go slow and just listen to somebody screaming. Time is running out, and uh, as it gets darker, the chances of us finding him are getting uh, smaller and smaller. Someone keep an eye on this guy. Make sure he doesn't go overboard. All right. Right now, we're taking it to the station. Uh, we're going to do a, a post-star boarding, and uh, we're going to uh, we're going to make sure he had all his required safety equipment, and we're going to have him evaluated by EMS because, like we said, he was underway for three days without food or water. I'm going to start slowing him down. You guys ready? ready? Yeah, we're ready on deck. All right, down to one engine. Ready. All right, break the bit. Hand tend off the starboard quarter. Right. One's made. Sir, could you put that just right over top of it? Right there. Beautiful. My name is Casey James Naylor, and I am a soldier in life for peace and freedom and happiness. I got into that bar and realized where I was. I just went to get out of the harbor, and I bit off a bit more than I was expecting. I caught a salmon with some of my hair. <laughs> I think the Coast Guard is amazing. They helped in a moment that I really, really needed help in. Here, well, let's start this inspection. There's a dock in here. Pedro. Hey, Pedro. You got a life jacket down here, too? Uh, negative. So I get on board, and the whole boat is just kind of in a tattered and deteriorated condition. His insulation seems to be ripping off. It looks like his window blew out. I've been remodeling. I might even put another little boat on both sides and make it a trimaran. He kept saying different things. I didn't quite understand what he was talking about most of the time. Sir, did you have any identification, photo ID, or anything? No. Nothing of that nature? We immediately noticed a lot of safety hazards, cracks in the floorboards, gentlemen's flares, expired in 1983. Uh, it definitely made my head kind of want to explode. The, the number on your documentation doesn't match the number on the boat. Oh. He said that he had traded his 1980 Honda Accord for the boat. Yeah, I don't, oh, here we go. Yeah, it matches. It's the right one. Yeah! <laughs> I am so happy. Thank you, US Coast Guard. You guys helped me so much in my life. Um, this is the boarding report. There is a few violations. I'm going to need you to get those taken care of before you depart port again. Absolutely. We ended up terminating his boat. Legally, he cannot get that boat back underway until he has all of his safety gear again. Thank you guys so much. You have a good night, sir. All right, backing up. We recommend everybody have a very seaworthy boat, especially out here. He was fine in relatively calm weather, but anything further than that, he probably would have been in serious trouble. Okay, 556, sailing vessel is safely moored. We're RTB. Cape 232, commencing fifth leg of the search pattern, negative results. Cape Roger. Water temp today was uh, right around 57 degrees. Uh, at that temperature, you, you really don't have a whole lot of time in the water. I would venture to say you're probably in the uh, in the one to two hour range. Two hours into the case, you kind of feel like you lost hope and uh, feel like you failed. 
They're taking off. You know, sometimes you know that it's like, it's impossible for this person to be out for this long. Tower 232 has completed its 10th leg of the creeping line search pattern, negative results. Search pattern with negative results. Uh, we were unable to recover anybody that uh, may have been in the water tonight, so we're headed back to the station. We were released from the case uh, and we RTB'd. You never really get word if it was a hoax or if you never found the person. You just uh, have to sometimes assume that there was nobody in the water. You know, hopefully, get some rest and uh, wait for the next call. if you need to. The fire at the cannery was a lot bigger than what we had expected. All right. Once we heard that there was chemicals involved with this fire, my initial reaction to this, uh, I got nervous. Keep the building wet. On that window if you can. Nobody really knew uh, how big of an explosion would occur. Welcome to Fort George. Hi, how you doing? You're here for the tour? Yep. Let's get a beer. B1 Todd Gormley from Station Cabin Disappointment. Today we're going to Fort George uh, to get a tour of the brewery and do some beer tasting. Fort George is kind of broken into three areas. You're going to have the part where they actually make the beer, where the restaurant is, and then where the bar is. Cheers, guys. And I'll show you how this whole place works here. It's pretty simple. You guys go to work on Monday. Chief Jeremiah Wolf, Coast Guard Station Cape Disappointment. As chief, it's sometimes difficult to get off campus, get out of the station, and go do things. The tour of Fort George was a great opportunity to get with uh, Dan Snyder, one of the surfmen, and Todd Gormley, one of the coxswains at the station, and go do something different. Get out in the community, it was awesome. There are four ingredients in beer. There's the grain, the water, the hops, and the yeast. We're really lucky to live out here where we have really great water, most of the grain is grown pretty close, the hops are grown pretty close, it's all, it's, it's all really pretty local. The Pacific Northwest is world renowned for its microbrews, and it's something that we like to do on our off time is go to the breweries, sample the beers. That grain comes across the back of the brew house here in this white PVC. The grain drops down and gets cracked in the mill. The mill cracks it, and another auger pulls it up to the top of the mash tun. We went uh, all the way through the brewery. We saw their process, uh, how they did their brewing. I just wanted to show you a couple of samples of what the grain looks like. And you put a couple of kernels on your hand, and you can chew on these. And then I'll just show you these others. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead and eat them. <laughs> you know, I have to just buy my beer at the store, so seeing actually how they make it, uh, there's a lot to it, way more than I, than I could comprehend. But it was cool, though. We uh, pump all the beer over here and add the fourth ingredient, the yeast. If the beer is really lucky, we'll run a hose over here to our canning machine. And this is our canning machine right here. The reason we wanted to go into cans, though, is uh, we determined it was best for the beer. That was the ultimate reason. Beer is super sensitive to light. So is that why they use brown bottles? Brown bottles will slow that down, but even your darkest amber bottle will eventually skunk a beer. It's interesting to see all the different ingredients that go into it, all the processes, how they've got it nailed down. It kind of reminds me of what we do at Station Cape Disappointment with all our training processes and uh, operational processes. Pull up a chair, and uh, Brad will bring us some tasters. OK. Awesome. Fort George has a wide variety of beer. I was surprised at all the different types and, and uh, tastes. You want the Coast Guard ever collaborate with us on a beer? A Coast Guard beer, that would be awesome. <laughs> Fort George is cool because it kind of seems like a meeting place for uh, people that go on the water a lot. You know, whether you're sitting next to the fisherman or a guy that you work with, you all go there, and it's kind of like common ground between everybody. It's always nice to find a place that you and all your friends really enjoy. You can go hang out, have a beer, and, uh, and kind of decompress. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Cape Disappointment, Triumph 112. 
Cape Tribe can copy Roger. If you could find out what fire department's working and what if they have a common frequency for us so we can at least be on the same comms as them once we get a little bit closer, I appreciate it. I'm Petty Officer Dan Snyder from Coast Guard Station, Cape Disappointment. So we got a call underway while we were training to respond to a shoreside fire in the Astoria Warrington area. Initially, we had very little details besides there was a possible structure fire or vessel fire on the water. The boat we were on scene with was the Triumph. It has a limited firefighting capability of a single fire hose with a very nozzle, similar to what you would see the firefighters have in the street. Cape Disappointment, do you know if uh, Washington Fire is requesting any assistance from us? Uh, we made contact with the fire command. They have no water side capability. Roger. Once we get secure, let's go ahead and grab a very nozzle and a like of hose, just in case. My name is Richard Abbas. I'm a machinery technician, third class. Very seldom we actually deal with fires. Um, we immediately start rigging up the, our deck for a firefighting if we needed to. I proceeded down to our engine room, make sure we we're good to go to light off our fire pump that the Triumph has installed. I mean, it's just an adrenaline rush. They have some water on the fire now. So once we make our way to the entrance here, we're just going to proceed slowly in. Cape Triumph, we're just approaching the entrance to skip it on this time. You can mark us on scene. We're going to just make our way slowly back here inside the waterway and see you. We can uh, provide any assistance or be available, find a safe spot to uh, station. It was a very large smoke plume. There was fire evident on the southern side of the building as we came around the corner. We were going in there pretty much wearing just the gear we wear for general trading. We talked about staying out of the fire. We talked about everyone speaking up if they should have any concerns about fumes, smoke, or flames, or heat. I imagine our role will be limited to just kind of supporting anything waterside. So I'd Highly unlikely we're gonna go in there with a fire hose charge and put any kind of water anywhere, but we may be available waterside just in case they have to get near the edges and fight the fire from the, the pier safe. It's looking like it's burning pretty good. Yeah. BM1, Todd Gormley from Station Cape Disappointment. When we saw it, uh, it was very, very noticeable. It looked like a huge fire even from a long distance. The initial thought of a big fire on the waterfront kind of got our blood flowing a little bit because it was, it was my first time to do something like that. 27516 is the uh, Coast Guard Triumph Coaster. Okay, Triumph 2705. I'm standing on the seawall on the north side of the building. I'd like you to uh, concentrate your wire on the northwest corner. Try to keep the fire from spreading north. Fine, just work the best you can. I've tried. Yes, I understand. Uh, northwest corner, hold the fire from spreading north. We're setting up now. All right, just got real. Seven and five, Triumph. Yes, I understand. Northwest corner, hold the fire from spreading north. We're setting up now. All right, just got real. If you guys feel like you get any fumes or any heat, let me know. We'll just back it out of there. All right, we're gonna come up here on the uh, pier and uh, attempt to put some water on the fire here and uh, see what we can do. If we get too close, it gets too hot. I just need to let them know and uh, try to back off. The wind plays a large factor in our ability to help flight, especially shoreside facilities. Uh, luckily, it was coming directly out of the south, which blew the smoke across the channel and gave us an entry to the north side of the fire. It's blowing away. You can get up further if you need to. The fire at the cannery was a lot bigger than what we had expected. Um, you could feel the heat when we were rolling up on it. Just all in this building. Go ahead. All right. Douse it. We were attacking the northwest uh, portion, uh, trying to prevent the fire from spreading uh, to the second floor. Keep the building wet. Pull that window if you can. We just got the information passed, so there's possible ammonia burning in the area. Uh, we don't know. Coast Guard Cutter Triumph. There's possibly 9,000 pounds of anhydrous ammonia stored somewhere on the property. They're not sure if it's this building or in the immediate vicinity. Honestly, I don't know much about it off my head. I know it's, it's used in the, in the processing of fish, and it's generally chemical. There's been some incidents in the Coast Guard in the past where just breathing the release gas has been bad news for people. Hey, what's the deal? I have no update for you. OK. So right now, we're just sort of standing by. I'm trying to get a hold of the fire captain, see what he wants you guys to do. OK. Once we heard that there was chemicals involved uh, with this fire, we got word from the incident commander to back off. Uh, my initial reaction to this, uh, I got nervous. 
you don't know what to think. I'm not trained uh, to know how chemicals react in different kinds of fire, so uh, I didn't really know what to expect. Um, I was glad to know that uh, the bow coxswain was going to back off the fire, and we're going to sit back and observe. Hey, they closed the waterway? I know, nobody's allowed in. So you guys can put the nozzle down if you want, and okay, stand fast. Hot one. We're gonna be fighting that puppy for a while. I guarantee you warranted fire is overwhelmed. Flames are going nuts. Dude, that's crazy! The entire channel is just engulfed in smoke. We were unsure if any ammonia had been burning inside the building. We had discussed this with our crew and our coxswain. He had told us if anybody at any time smells anything, starts to feel weird at all, lightheaded, we'll just back out completely because uh, we weren't equipped with any breathing apparatuses that the fire department has. Oh, I don't know. On the dock over there, can you guys hear this? Yeah, let's go, let's go. Black Cat, wave at me if you can hear me. We were on edge the whole time. We were back far enough, uh, we hoped, to uh, be not in the explosion zone, but uh, nobody really knew uh, how big of an explosion would occur. I don't think they're really trying to save that building. I think they're just letting it go. I don't either, because there's only one hose on yeah, the fire. I, I think they just don't want it to get closer to the tank that they're all worried about. We were on scene with the fire for approximately eight hours. We were just supporting the fire department in case they had anybody fall in the water. And we were also there to help secure the waterway and make sure no other boats came into the uh, contact with the hazardous chemicals or if anything collapsed and fell in the waterway. It's out. So I don't have a full report of what happened on, on the land side with the fire department. Water side, we were only able to provide a minimal effort, but the fire department seemed, however, isolate the, uh, the ammonia tanks from the rest of the fire. The structure, unfortunately, was a loss, but if the uh, ammonia tanks would have lit off, it would have been you know, a large tragedy for the small community in this area. This was a huge excitement for uh, me to be involved with uh, fighting this fire. Uh, it kind of reminds you why you're doing this, why you're here, and uh, you just get a sense of accomplishment every time, every case. Not every case is the same, and not every case requires the same response from us. This fish plant was a big part of the community. They have provided a lot of jobs. So we all, ourselves and the fire department, want to do the best of our ability to A, maintain a safe scene, and B, try to preserve all the structure that we could within our abilities. Mm -hmm.